in the farm sector uh, a, 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 a drive for increasing exports and freer trade as far back as the 70s. Can you give some of the, the background in terms of the way that deregulation progressed in the 70s and 80s in the lead up to NAFTA? Well, the, um, the most clear links for us are all the way back to the 1930s when the, the U.S. crisis, which actually was a much more of a global crisis that we call the Great Depression, had all the same elements of prior economic crisis or panics. We use different words, but in the 30s we called it the Great Depression. Um, farm prices collapsed. Uh, there were promises that exports would save us, but they didn't. Um, and President Roosevelt, uh, with many, many other thinkers and political leaders and policymakers, uh, created a new approach to agricultural policy, which essentially put a floor or minimum under basic farm products. It also controlled imports and exports to keep a supply management so there weren't uh, great overproductions or underproductions, surpluses or shortages. And it also established the basic principle that in global trade, food was different than shoes or sandals or something else. So from the 1930s up into the 1940s and early 1950s, this uh, Roosevelt farm policy or uh, New Deal farm policy uh, really set the standard for the United States. But when the uh, U.S. and other countries began negotiating the post-Second War II global economic forum, the global economic system we call the Bretton Woods systems today, there was a huge battle inside the United States uh, policymakers. In fact, at the conference where uh, what was called the International Trade Organization, which evolved to be the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which is now the World Trade Organization, um, the U.S. State Department advocated a complete and total free trade position on agriculture. The U.S. Department of Agriculture and other uh, policymakers argued that that would be disastrous for the whole world. And in fact, the final form of those first global or multilateral trade agreements, um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture position essentially won. And there were standards established globally about how agricultural policies could be protected. It turns out Canada is the only country that ever really lived up to the policies which essentially were that with um, the combination of supply management, then countries could set their own policies around price, imports, and exports. But in any case, that policy, which was uh, warred in the larger political debates in the late 40s and 50s, by the early 1970s, the United States had begun to dismantle those policies. The crisis for farmers was very apparent. Uh, there was a new round of promises that we would export our way to heaven. And in fact, the most important of those single reports that came out during the Nixon administration advocated that the U.S. approach to our growing trade deficit, keep in mind the U.S. didn't have trade deficits until the 1960s or at least for a hundred and some years, was that the U.S. should specialize in, in exporting the two things that we were the most successful in. One, high-tech weaponry. Two, basic agriculture products, primarily corn. So that policy was pursued. We pursued that policy through trade agreements, through internal policies, and of course, inside the United States, the result was a crisis for our farmers. And so there was the underlying push to move to these new, broader agreements. I have to say that the, the, um, the forces that come together aren't really all that aligned in thinking about the same things. Maude talked about the service companies, American Express, especially the head of American Express who led much of the sort of public fight. Uh, I think he went on to prison actually, but in any case, he was very, very powerful in how he led his, his uh, coalition of groups. But I think at the end of the day, these agreements were driven much more by ideology and thinking married to a very specific economic interest of a company or a sector. By far the most dramatic in the Uruguay round was the expansion of the free trade idea to services and to basic uh, economic uh, health-related economic industries like healthcare and drugs. 
And when somebody claims that these agreements are free trade agreements, I like to point out that that's just not true. We don't have free access to drugs and pharmaceuticals manufactured in Canada. We just don't really have free trade. But we do have a set of trade rules that people today have articulated how uh, devastating they've been. They've been great for some people. They've been devastating for others. But they're not free trade in the sense that we have access to drugs in Canada, that workers from other countries have access. They're not really free trade agreements. But they do point us in the direction of the need for global agreements and global understandings. And so an evolution in the past decade of what we call fair trade rules has been a really important outcome. The evolution of agreements around shared natural resources, some of which we can see in the agreements around the Great Lakes. There are very interesting things going on at, that have been for a long time. Other countries are proposing different relationships in southern Africa in that zone. They have a different set of agreements. So the policies have come from the unwillingness to necessarily tackle directly the economic crisis that comes from other policies. But perhaps in this new era, what we have the opportunity to do is really know what the impact is in other parts of the country, other countries, other parts of the world, and then to bring that into our hearts and into our minds in the articulation of a real policy. I give great credit to CUSTA, the Canadian-US Trade Agreement, and to NAFTA for bringing us into contact with and then personal relationship with and then committed political relationships with our partners in other countries because now I feel like for the first time, at least in my political lifetime, it's possible to look at a problem and gather information from people in other countries and other sectors about that problem. It's possible to gather ideas of solutions to that problem from many, many perspectives. And it's possible to ask our friends in Mexico and Canada and around the world, hey, we have this problem. We're thinking about this solution. What is your perspective on that problem, on that solution? What are the unintended or unimagined consequences? How could we make it better? And how could we together help each other to make our analysis stronger, better, more comprehensive? our solutions more globally aware, more globally respectful, and to actually put together the political power necessary to put a real solution on a problem that we've clearly stated and articulated. So those are some of the possibilities that come after this end of you know, 50 or 60 years of dancing around neoliberal economic policies. Thank you.